Welcome everyone to tonight's webinar event, Peripheral Bronchoscopy, How Robotic Integrated Imaging Will Change the Way We Practice. This webinar is sponsored by NOAA Medical. We want to thank their continued support and being 2023 SAB sponsors. Before we get started, just a few reminders if you are new here. You have joined in a listen-only mode. Please submit all your questions through your control panel under the question feature or feel free to submit them through the chat box. We will address all the questions at the end of the lecture. At this time, I'm going to hand it off to Dr. Kyle Hogarth and he will begin the presentation. Thank you. All right. So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna talk about you know the unmet need. And I think for anyone who does any amount of time in peripheral bronchoscopy and my esteemed colleagues that I'm here with, I think the value of tonight's webinar is the fact that the three of us work with completely different systems uh, and have a lot of experience in peripheral bronchoscopy and have partly been through uh, a lot of this um, growth that's gone on. So, you know, peripheral bronchoscopy obviously originally started uh, it, it way back in the sense of just taking a scope with fluoro and pushing forceps out and hoping you could see the lesion and just grabbing it. There was no getting out there further. Smaller scopes and the use of a radial EBUS probe helped to get us out there further, but as we know, there's limits to radial EBUS. The world changed, obviously, with the first uh, navigation platform that uh, allowed us to at least have some reliability in the periphery with the superdimension system. Um, and the Navigate multi-centered study, a very large study, showed it some value. Um, but also, I think what it demonstrated was the limitations. So I think those of us that have used that system knew what we could do, knew what we were good at, but also new areas that were going to be challenging. Same with the uh, Varen system, the SPIN system, uh, similar uh, yet different technology than the superdimension system originally. Um, and then from a catheter-based technology, um, we also had then as the robotics came out, the ION system by Intuitive um, that uh, used shape sensing uh, from a catheter-based perspective to get out. Um, and uh, obviously when uh, uh, Chris has got a lot of experience with that system, um, and then from a robotic bronchoscope that had um, um, information that allowed you to still use optics, but use electromagnetic, um, multiple different studies, as well as the other ones that from Intuitive, and that's the Monarch platform. It's one that I obviously have a lot of experience with um, and many others as well. So this is where we've been at. And, 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 and again, this has definitely been a nice advancement, I think, for all of us. And the first generation of robots between Monarch and Ion um, definitely allowed us to do more than what we had done in the past. But we still fan, found significant issues with CT to body divergence. And we found significant issues for all of us with diagnostic yields. We had the ability to get to a lesion. We seem to have a, an inability to get a call on all of our lesions. And, and I know Chris will talk about it as well. But one of our biggest problems was always proving that we actually had a tool inside the actual lesion. Next slide. And here's our... The, the bane of our bronchoscopy existence, the CT to body divergence. So virtual navigation bronchoscopy, this is not your actual target. You know, so every you know, platform essentially uses a CT scan and then tells you where that nodule is in relation to the airways. And you navigate there again by whatever means, whether that's visual, whether that's shape sensing, whether that's electromagnetic, it doesn't matter, but you're ultimately navigating to a virtual representation that you hope its relationship to all the other airways and the various mapping that you're using hasn't changed or shifted. Next slide. And obviously a nice paper by Pritchett and Badra and Folk and others has demonstrated how big of a problem this is. Um, why do we get it? Well, some of these examples you can see, but it makes sense if you think about it. Start with just the simple atelectasis. We're in there for a while, you're futzing around with an airway, or maybe you, you intubated the patient and it took a while and you've had de-recruitment and God forbid you're going after the lower lobes where it's going to be even worse. You get tissue distortion. You know, the, obviously the lung is pliable. That's one of the reasons we get away with what we do. The airways move. You're putting stress on them. You are quite literally shifting them with whatever navigation platform you're using. And then at the same time, you're trying to find a lesion and you might have hemorrhage that can also change the shape of the lung and then also the density of the lung for the imaging you're doing. And then obviously, if there's a new pleural effusion, changes in anatomy, and let's not forget, and I know Chris and Mike have done a lot of work in this area as well, that the patient's CT scan was taken at total lung capacity, not under general anesthesia, with their arms above their head, and now they're bronching and being scoped at traditionally under anesthesia, plus or minus paralytics, with their arms at their side, 
and more likely breathing at FRC and nowhere breathing near TLC. Next slide. As basically stated here, you know, at the core of us, we're, we're all pulmonologists and we have most of the time when we're doing a navigation bronch, the traditional approach has been just like under any anesthesia approach. They're breathing at tidal volumes, except that that CT scan that's made all of its measurements and all of the airway relationships was done at TLC, right, at a full breath. And so you've got already a, just a divergence at where you are volumetrically um, when you're doing this. Next slide. So you say, okay, well, don't I overcome all that with radial probe? You know, this gets me, got, it's got to get me near it. And if I can prove that I'm there with radial probe, that should be good enough. Well, let's go into the problems with radial probe. And, and I think we also know this because there's obviously been a lot of good work in radial probe studies. Uh, Alex Chen's done a lot of nice work and, and others. And of course, when you look, um, if there was a concentric lesion, as you know, we had really good yield, but eccentric lesions, we had a very uh, large drop in yield. But there's still the issue of why wasn't it as good as it should be? Well, of course, what mimics radial probe signal? So first of all, let's start with the fact that rebus is only lateral looking. So if you are quite literally running into an airway, you may not actually even get much of a signal. Um, the image lacks directionality. So you have this natural instinct, you know, if the lesion is sort of at 11 o'clock in your mind, that's the direction you need to go. But in reality, that lesion could actually be over at five o'clock. So the image you get on rebus does not anatomically correlate to a direction on the clock. Non-aerated lung or atelectatic lung and or hemorrhage produce a concentric pattern, sharply demarcated or irregular borders that can mimic lung nodules. Um, and this false positive image can result in obviously an inappropriate confidence on our part and biopsy of non-diagnostic material, right? Next slide. And when you take a look at studies that obviously have high sensitivities, we ought to also be, I think, always nervous about the issues of publication bias, and we should always be interpreting these with caution. I always got a great rebus signal, so therefore I did really well. You know, how often did you not get a good rebus signal? How often did you get a rebus signal that was, uh, you thought was great, but your not, biopsy was non-diagnostic? And remember, this is a, a probe that you then pull out, and then you place your instrument down, and you have no idea where it's going. Um, most of the systems that are used for peripheral bronchoscopy, the optics are not there. There's no optics on uh, electromagnetic navigation with, with the um, Medtronic platforms. There's no optics when you're passing instruments through on the intuitive platform. The Monarch does have optics. Sometimes, depending on the, the view, you may not have you know, a perfect view. Um, but you don't have any guarantee that you're actually putting your instrument where this radial probe signal was. And again, without directionality, how do you even know which direction to actually put your needle or push your forceps, et cetera? Possibly the inod system that's coming out might solve this. Obviously, it remains to be seen, um, but we'll, we'll, we'll stay tuned on that one too. Next slide. So we need to correct for this. I mean, CT to body divergence, it's the bane of our existence. You know, you I always tell people, you know, I try to describe it as the GPS thinks you're on Main Street, but you're on Elm Street. No wonder you're not there, right? And so if you could update and correct at a micro level and prove, oh, oh, shoot, I'm actually on Elm Street. Let me back up and turn over onto Main Street where the lesion's actually located. And so there's some ways to correct for it right now that are essentially sort of aftermarket. You can use a system like Lung Vision. You can use um, uh, and Cone Beam to correct for CT to body divergence. So Cone Beam does it. Lung vision does it, mobile, mobile fluoro 3D systems do it. The problem with every single one of these is that they are an additional cost on top of already the large cost that you place to purchase your robot. So for example, you know, if you own a Monarch or an Ion, at whatever you paid for it, a significant amount, you would have made the assumption that it's got everything you need to confirm you're in the lesion. Now, you will hear from both manufacturers that you can use cone beam, you can use the SIO spin, you can go spend another $450,000 to make this $600,000 device work better. If you're lucky like Chris, you have cone beam already, but I think it's Chris and Mike and that's about it who get full access to it. The rest of us get it occasionally if we donate a kidney. Um, you know, I know some folks who get it every other Saturday, which sounds awesome. So, you know, you've got this problem. Um, and and Alumasite, uh, to its credit, took the super dimension platform and updated the lesion location using tomosynthesis. 
Um, it's still obviously a catheter-based system without stability from a robotics perspective, but it, it essentially was a nice solution. So if you kind of get the theme here, you know, there's every system that's out there's kind of got some level of a fatal flaw, and then you can use some aftermarket solutions, but there's always an inherent expense there. So all the commercially available robotics currently don't have that ability to correct for it without these expensive hardware add-ons, and Sios for an example. Next slide. So we need tool and lesion confirmation, right? At a minimum, and then fully recognizing that that doesn't always mean the lesions inside the actual tool inside the instrument. But at a minimum, if you know, this, and this image shows you, if I can see a needle in multiple planes inside the lesion, I know I'm there. This isn't navigation success. This is center strike, my needle's there. And if you're not in it, you can make adjustments to your instrument. And if you're in the lesion, you can utilize your biopsy tools, pick one, go ahead and go with it. And the current robotic platforms cannot accomplish this on their own. Next slide. And they've got wide variability. I won't spend a lot of time on this. We know the reason we're here having this discussion is that we still have an unmet need, right? If, if any of the studies that have been published to date on any of the platforms have, was satisfying our ability to prove that we could always get to a lesion and prove that we could get into the center of the lesion, we wouldn't be even here tonight. Next slide. So we've got to overcome these gaps in robotics with imaging. Next slide. So how do we address it? Well, again, we've got these external versions, right? Is this your slide, Chris? Yeah, this is it. This is it. Right. Your slide? So thanks right, for I'm going to shut up. <laughs> I'm going to shut up and let Chris and let Chris talk. But let, let I will make one quick minor uh, addition. So every time we talk about bronchoscopy, we always talk about how CT guided biopsy, you know, needle biopsy, interventional radiology has such a high yield. And yes, high complications, it doesn't stage. But why do they have high yields? Because they can see the tool inside the lesion. How come people that have cone beam systems have high yields? They can see the tool inside the lesion. But cone beam is not gonna be accessible to the masses. And if you get, again, convince your system to buy you an expensive robotic device to additionally purchase a mobile 3D fluoro cone beamy type thing, you might be able to do it, but it's definitely an extra lift. So we've got to address it. So now I'll be quiet and welcome, Chris. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Kyle. Yeah, so you're hitting the nail on the head, which is talking about the existing gaps in robotics. And the main gaps are CT to body divergence, which you covered very nicely. And there's no real-time lesion updates. So you drive out um, and you have no idea where you are with the current commercial robotic platforms. And then you do these multi, uh, uh, multiple biopsies through cloud biopsies, whatever you want to call them. And you have this risk of utilizing radial probe that may have false positives. And so you could come back with the most frustrating experience uh, that, we, that all high volume users of navigation bronchoscopy experience, which is a non-diagnostic biopsy. Um, so as a person who really believes in imaging, I can tell you that I was the, uh, the first person to use digital tomosynthesis with floral nav, uh, was in the phase one study for body vision, um, and, um, and of, uh, one of the pioneers or one of the high volume users for cone beam CT bronchoscopy. And I will tell you that the great equalizer for bronchoscopy is advanced imaging. And so it doesn't mean that I'm a great bronchoscopist, this means if we can give you the imaging that you need so you know where to go, all of a sudden, everybody looks like a great bronchoscopist. Next slide. And so I utilized comb beam, and I want to reinforce the idea uh, that Kyle was talking about is it's truly not accessible to everyone. Um, I have to share a room with several different service lines. Um, and so there's been some really good studies talking about comb beam in particular and how it's affected both Electromagnet, electromagnetic navigation platforms and shape sensing platforms. So this is by uh, the Harvard group with Fayez Kier, Nadan Maj uh, Majid and Takor. Uh, next slide. This is a great study because this is a very small number of patients where they looked at 31 patients who underwent ENB bronchoscopy and 31 patients who underwent ENB with CBCT imaging. And the first thing that you'll notice is that the diagnostic yield improved from a dismal 51.6% up to 74.2% when they added in the advanced imaging. 
Not only that, if you look just two lines above it with a p-value of 0 0.02, the time, the median time for the bronchoscopy actually decreased when you utilize advanced imaging. And I think that's going to hold out for a lot of users because uh, the workflow is just much more simplified. And what I like about uh, this study is that they utilized a multivariate regression analysis and they incorporated the size of the lesion, the distance from the pleura, and the presence of a bronchus sign, and the odds ratio that you'd have an improved diagnostic yield with advanced imaging with cone beam is 3.4. And so that tells you that if you add advanced imaging to whatever platform that you're utilizing, in this case ENB, your diagnostic yield is going to go up. Next slide. This study, um, which was done by um, Eric uh, Vanderheijden and Roll, and I had the privilege of going to their lab um, in the Netherlands. Next slide. They did a very good study looking at the impact of cone beam CT uh, image imaging in addition to electromagnetic navigation bronchoscopy. And I'm going to bring your attention to the bottom of the slide where it says table two. What you're going to notice is that they used primary CBCT navigation with augmented fluoroscopy. Their primary navigation was 76.3% um, tooling lesion. And then when they combined it with EMN, it went up 13.6% to 89.9%. When they utilized just EMN alone, like you would with a Monarch robot or one of the older generations of Superdimension, it would be 52% and astonishing 35% improvement in diagnostic and tooling lesion of 87.5%. And so what you'll see is that the EMN enhanced the cone beam CT guidance and the cone beam CT enhanced EMN, but the CBCT or the advanced imaging enhanced EMN to a much greater extent. So again, another study that shows when you would add in advanced imaging, your diagnostic yield dramatically improves. Both, is, and so that's very important in this study. Next slide. When we talk about looking at ION, this is a from, from their study, the precise study, which utilizes shape sensing, um, and they added cone beam into the into a subset, and it was 34 consecutive patients with 40 nodules with very small lung lesions of 17.5 millimeters. Um, a, uh, only a very small percentage had a bronchus sign of 28.2 percent, and 50% of them were in contact with the pleura. So this is, these are, are relatively hard lesions to go after because they're small, they're out up against the pleura. And with cone beam tool and lesion confirmation, they had 91% per subject and 87% per nodule. Next slide. Next slide. I think you have to press it one more time. So when you look at this, you'll see the diagnostic yield with advanced cone beam CT bronchoscopy, uh, the diagnostic yield is in the 90s, and the sensitivity for malignancy is in the 90s. And so that's extremely important to understand. So next slide. What you're gonna find is that I used my ion without advanced imaging and my results were not as good. They were similar to what the Siwu paper, which is 77% with shape sensing alone. And so I fully recognize that I need to use advanced imaging. Kyle Hogarth utilizes, this is his case with Monarch, with body vision. He recognizes that the Monarch alone isn't as good without an adjunctive technology that gives you advanced imaging like body vision. Dr. Majahan, Bobby had a Monarch, returned it, and ended up utilizing Superdimension with Illumisci or fluoro, uh, fluoro nav. So you have three people who do a very high volume of navigation bronchoscopy with different platforms, and we all come to the exact same conclusion. We all, I think everybody here on this panel will say, we like robotics, but we need advanced imaging to be able to get to these lung lesions. Because when you do virtual bronchoscopy with just GPS or shape sensing alone, you don't know where you are, and your results are going to be in the 70% range, and you're going to be stuck there. And that's not a great advancement um, when you when you compare it to the Super D trials. And so I think this is where we are at this, this point in time where we're looking for a technology 
that will give us both a robotic platform and an integrate advanced imaging. Bobby, next slide. Thanks, Krish. I, I, Kyle, I appreciate the uh, the discussion. I think um, Kyle and Krish have set this up beautifully because at the end of the day, we've talked about the common denominator in every kind of discussion we have, whether it be on the podium, um, in the Bronx suite, over dinner, that no matter what we use, whether it's robotics, uh, electromagnetic navigation, we have to have some kind of advanced imaging. And the challenge we run into um, is that without advanced imaging, without some kind of platform, um, whether it be uh, body vision, Illumisite, uh, a, a, a SIO span, a cone beam, we're really doing a disservice to our patients when we don't know we're in a lesion and we're taking biopsies. Now, we've used the idea of cone beam CT significantly in the sense that do we have access to it? And Kyle's right, we don't have access to it on a regular basis. So we've used surrogates and saying, do we have concentric lesions with uh, radial EBIS. Again, we know that even though you have a concentric lesion, you might not have a diagnostic yield because the tissue might not actually be in the needle, even though you believe the needle is in the actual tissue. So what do we use? We have to say we moved and advanced our understanding of diagnostic yield, not only to say, are we getting into the lesion, but we have to have something that confirms our needle is in the lesion. That's what lets me go to sleep at night knowing I didn't miss on a lesion that I've told a patient it looks good. But we gotta get another CT in four months because I gotta make sure that the, uh, the nodule hasn't grown. And this is what we deal with on a regular basis. And this is what I've dealt with for the last nine years, trying to say, how do we merge this understanding of biopsies, imaging, and honestly, providing the best care for our patients, knowing that we can biopsy adequately and effectively. Um, so next slide, please. So, you know, I'm going to talk about the galaxy system here, but more so in the sense that until now, the value proposition that we as bronchoscopists have understood with regards to robotics has not existed where it should because of an imaging, um, I would say, gap in terms of capabilities. We are talking about do we really believe the green ball represents a lesion? And we know that there are definite reasons that it doesn't not only CT to body divergence like we talked about, but a lot of atelectasis that Krish and Pritchett have um, shown, but also at the same time, the actual capabilities of driving out to those lesions is dependent on not the robot, it's dependent on the user. So the idea that a ro robot is gonna make you better, it, it doesn't really make sense. In a lot of ways, the bronchoscopist and understanding of the anatomy gets you only so far. At the end of the day, there has to be something to update where that lesion is to make up for the CT divided divergence. And secondly, then to confirm that a tool is actually in that lesion. And that really is where some of the, tel te the tilt technology that comes in to the Galaxy system by NOAA. So I will tell you that Chris is right. I've ex had experience with every robot so far that's come out there with um, bronchoscopy and honestly, I haven't been satisfied. Um, there's no imaging component to confirm that what I'm driving out to a biopsy is really uh, the lesion. And as a result, I focused on tomosynthesis. That has been the goal and the basis for which I do biopsies. And our, our yields have significantly improved into the high 80s and 90s because I know where the lesion is. And this is what the value proposition has failed, mainly because we don't have the stability that we need when it comes to a navigation catheter-based program and the imaging at the same time. And that's what we see with the Galaxy system. So again, you know, NOAA has taken a great deal of time and done the development in a really uh, professional and organized way in developing not the TILT system, which really is tool-in lesion tomography technology. When we drive out to these lesions and get to proximity of the nodule, where we believe it is, in the setting of CT to biodivergence, we use the same normal flor uh, uh, fluoroscopy unit that's in most bronchoscopy labs to do a spin. And that spin will take data from multiple angles of the actual image, bring them together to highlight a lesion. And that will allow us to update where that lesion is in relation to the new change in lung function that's going on during anesthesia. 
we update that lesion to make sure the green ball really represents the green ball. Now, we've seen that in the Lumicide platform, and we know that data from uh, Vanderbilt has shown significant improvement in diagnosis. And getting out to that nodule, taking a biopsy, again, previous to that, we still are relying on navigation because even though we update that lesion, we don't know in real time that we're in the nodule. The tilt technology allows you to not only drive out to the nodule, but to advance a tool pretty much compatible with any kind of needle or biopsy tool that is out there. And while the tool is in the lesion, to repeat the spin and actually see that needle in the lesion. That's the game changer here, because frankly, at the end of the day, again, I don't need to have a diagnosis of cancer, but I do have to have a diagnosis of my needle in that nodule. Previously, you need an adjunct imaging uh, uh, platform, such as a CO spin, a portable CT scan, a comb beam. And again, we've talked about it. Some You may be able to get a hold of one of those uh, platforms, but the cost that comes with that is just not sustainable in our profession. Honestly, for, we know that bronchoscopy is a challenge in terms of make, showing some contribution margin and showing it sustainably. This Galaxy system integrates image-guided therapy uh, diagnosis with robotics. And as a result, it's all in one package. Um, not only do we have to make up for that CT biodivergence, but this is where we are able to say, look, we, can, can, we have something as close to comb beam as possible from a regular floral machine. And again, that is what's gonna change how we bring diagnostic yields up to where they should be in the 80s and 90s to everyone, whether you're in New York City or you're in the middle of Idaho, you should be able to get the yield that you see at any high volume center because you know where the nodule is. There's changes that we made actually to improve outcomes, not only from a diagnostic yield standpoint, but also just from a, um, a I would say, cross-contamination standpoint. Every scope being used for the Galaxy system is disposable. It's single use. There's no risk of cross-contamination with a 4.0 outer diameter, a 2.1 working channel. Um, really what we look at is the articulation is superb compared to any other uh, platform out there. And right now, and we'll talk about this shortly, you remove the scope and throw it away. Really one of the challenges we run into is running cases one, at, one after another because of reusing scopes, having to clean them, and honestly, the setup that is associated with uh, robotics at this uh, the, at the current state. Hey, Bobby, also, there's a lot of yeah. there's a lot of hidden costs to scope reprocessing as well, too, for a sure. center. Yeah, right? and we're going to talk about that shortly. Not only for the reprocessing, but also the washers that go into that to build a new Bronx suite for some of these uh, scopes. We're spending fifty, sixty thousand dollars just for the reprocessing. Additionally, the ability to only use five of these scope five at a time, um, it becomes an issue mainly with turnover. Um, and you know, most institutions, when we look at um, understanding, not only is this feasible and sustainable, but is are we looking at the overall program development? Can it survive with these different kinds of costs, especially if the robotic procedures are being done in an operating room, but we're not getting the yields we need because we don't have integrated imaging. So the capital itself is a very small unit comparably to any of the other robotic platforms, um, 6.3 foot square feet. And honestly, we know that some of our Bronx suites are extremely small. So the idea of trying to put multiple units into one Bronx suite can be challenging. Um, and honestly, it can be a team safety issue in, for, your, for your staff. And last, again, we talk about the spin and the tilt. It's compatible with most C-arms and almost all any biopsy tool. So I don't have to, make an exchange for the type of needle I need, the type of forcep I need, the cryo probe I need. This is all integrated into what we're doing on a regular basis, but improving stability and visualization that the current robotic platforms don't offer. Next slide. So again, this is exciting. Um, not only with the tilt reconstruction, we, you know, this is a, uh, using the Lumicide platform at the time right now, um, I probably have done over a thousand uh, tomosynthesis spins, and the imaging we're seeing with tilt reconstruction really changes the game. Um, we're able to see the lesion with clarity, uh, very similar to a comb beam image in the coronal fields, and we have fl augmented fluoroscopy on top of that lesion, as you can see um, in the second to the left uh, box. So not only on the floor are we knowing we're hitting the lesion, but we're able to superimpose it on our current fluoroscopy. 
Now, I will say the strike point and what Kyle likes to call is strike point Cobra um, is it's giving us an objective view of if you are in the lesion. And this, this has really changed what we do. For me, uh, we know that we're in plane when we spin our, our uh, fluoro. But now we can actually take the lesion from the center of the nodule and know once we've done our tool and lesion spin, if we're off center. So an objective number provides data that you're in line with the lesion or you're offline, allowing you to say, well, I have to make an adjustment. And these fine robotic adjustments that we utilize and really um, treasure with both the ION and the um, Monarch systems are being done. But again, we're having to do multiple changes in the floro, multiple biopsies. In this case, we're gonna be able to confirm we're in the right place objectively with an actual number. So uh, Chris, Kyle, um, and um, Otis and myself were involved in the MATCH study, which is a, a really elegant study done um, not in cadavers, but in live ventilated pigs with injected lesions. Not just trying to see if we got purple uh, material on biopsy. Instead, we had to get not only a diagnostic yield of injected purple um, lesions, but we had to make the decision that once we put the biopsy needle in, we would spin a cone beam on those pigs and actually see if the needle is in the middle of the lesion. So that's not that's not taken with a faint of heart in the sense that just getting a diagnosis on the edge of the lesion is not gonna be a success for us. We wanted the needle in the middle of the nodule. Um, so looking at that, diagnostic yield was 100%, meaning of those 20 lesions, we got purple lesion every single time. 95% needle in the lesion with one touching the lesion. So again, take back, take this into, you know, take a step back and think about this. In a live breathing animal, we were able to not only confirm a diagnosis every single time, but with a cone beam spin, we knew that the needle was in the middle of the nodule based on initially the tilt reconstruction confirmed with a cone beam CT. I mean, that's no joke. I mean, you, that is exactly what we looked for for years and years, but we actually have the ability to do it without using a cone beam CT. Meaning we weren't able to make an adjustment after the cone beam lesion, uh, spin. We had one cone beam spin on every nodule to confirm we were in the right place. So you know, just to say more gray hair came out of that than anything uh, and, and lost hair except for Chris. Uh, so again, <laughs> The diagnostic yield and in lesion is what we were looking for. And again, you can't emulate this data with any of the other uh, uh, platforms out there, especially in a breathing animal. Okay, next slide. Yeah. One of the things that you're talking about, and you can go to the next slide, but um, a lot of the other uh, platforms talk about lesion localization. And what they're talking about, they, they quote this really high number of 96% in their cadaver studies. That they get lesion localization but that's that's the robot platform Correct. going virtual ball and like you were saying we actually could visualize that we were in the lesion and we didn't have a lot of uh a lot of time to learn this we we actually had to go to a lab we turned on the machine we understood in theory what we were doing and we did it and all four of us got 100 percent diagnostic yield uh, and Bobby, I know you were last, so we were really worried when uh, I knew that you were stressed because we were not stressed. <laughs> not gonna lie, I was in I was in uh, all business mode that day, right? We had to turn the hip hop down in the room. So, I mean, I, but I will also say that, and I want to take a step back to what Chris said. We did the the cone beam last to confirm we're in the lesion, but what we're able to do throughout the procedure with the normal fluoro is that we. Put, we got to our lesion localization, we would spin to update where the lesion was, correct it with our, uh, our local registration, and then put a needle into the lesion. Now, if we didn't think we were in a good spot, we could re-spin, do another tilt spin, and again, see where the needle was by also using strike point to confirm objectively we're in the right place. So you could do two, three, four spins with the regular fluoro to make sure you're in the right space. And that is essentially what we're doing on a regular basis when we use cone beam CT. When I do a cone beam, not as much as Chris by any means, but I end up doing at least two or three spins to make sure you're in the right place. 
again, we don't have that option, but we do have that option in confirming where we are now with a tool with as many spins as we need using the and Floro. Bobby, you'll frequently hear yeah. also people who do a lot of cone beam talk about how they don't always use cone beam 3D. Correct. But if you've seen the quality of the 2D Floro on some of these cone beam systems, they're better than any of my standard C arm that I use. Yeah. And so I always take with a grain of salt when a guy who has cone beam using it in 2D tells you how he hits everything without using cone beam. That fluoro in 2D is already a thousand times better than your CR. Right. Correct. You can you can see on on a fixed cone beam system a lesion down to a centimeter. And so when you hear these numbers, oh, I utilize, you know, I use a robotic platform, I get 90% plus. Um, that's because of the cone beam. It's not because sure. of the of the EMN or the shape right. sensing. There's nothing to do with that. It's the cone beam. So what? Well, I think, you know, again, we, we have to come back to the reality is that regardless of what we're doing with any robotic platform, any handheld platform, catheter based platform, we haven't moved the needle in terms of diagnostic yield without some adjunct imaging, right? The ability to pay for that imaging is out of, honestly, reach for most hospitals, especially when you look at per case tick it's gonna be significantly cost losing. And at the same time, it's gonna make it very hard to justify and sustain your growth of your program. So, you know, we talked about single use scopes and most hospitals um, are definitely embracing this, not only because there's such a significant improvement in the imaging associated with these single use scopes, but also from a cross contamination infection control standpoint. And honestly, efficiency. The efficiency of using a single use scope is, um, can be cannot be compared to what we're doing with re, uh, reusable scopes. The challenge you run into is that your reusable scopes, unfortunately, are not taken into the cost per case of each case, while disposables are. Yet at the same time, the amount of injury and repair that associated with reusable scopes can be up to twelve thousand dollars a year. I'll tell you, we use way more than twelve thousand a year in terms of our. Um, reusable scopes, we're probably closer to 40, 50,000 because of the number of bronchoscopies that are performed. There's no fatigue or drift, and Krish uh, has a lot of data on this in terms of there's significant drift on scopes that we use, mainly because the more often we utilize them and the more times they've been used, the actual capabilities of holding that shape start to fade. Um, that's just a fact, and that's you know common mechanics. Infection control is, this is a given. I mean, I think that everyone has been in a whole new world with regards to understanding infection control and the fact that there is cross-contamination associated with reusable scopes, whether they be bronchoscopes traditionally or the reusable robotic scopes. The additional cost, again, I think that when we look at repairs, we see improvement, but I think that really what we've seen from a, a team standpoint is the reprocessing of scopes, the exposure to the different types of chemicals, the cost associated with new washers, it really can't be compared when it comes to a, a, a disposable scope. We as bronchoscopists know it's a better option. The problem we run into is justifying and showing that to our administration, which again, I think this kind of robotic platform, especially with the cost uh, value, it can't be, it cannot be uh, compared and from a disposable approach as well. Next yeah, slide. One, and one Grace, of, go ahead, please. No, and you can go to the next slide as well. Um, I think one of the things I want to hone in on is this reprocessing uh, issue with the robotic platforms, and I'm, I can speak to at least my experience. So we, we're, uh, we're one of the highest volume sites for uh, ION, especially as a single user, um, and uh, we had to hire an FTE, a full-time employee, to be able to wash the scopes uh, so we could keep up with our pace. Not only that, we had to, yeah, we had to buy two uh, two washers. And when you buy the washers, it doesn't really help you that much because out of the 16 steps, the majority of the steps still have to be done by a person. Um, and not only that, you had to buy containers of what they call critical water, um, which is, can become expensive. And we store water bottles all over um, our, uh, you know, our room. And this is, and, you know, and we have to, basically every cabinet is filled with water. And this becomes an issue. Um, when you think about this, and this was all hidden to me, I didn't even know this until the platform came into my building. Um, and what the hardest part about this is when you become a very high volume bronchoscopist and you're just trying to get your case done, um, and then you find out that day your scope washer is uh, out for a week on vacation, 
we want them to be out. I've actually had to go back there and help them. And the last thing I want to do is to be able to go back there and try and wash scopes in the middle of the day or teach somebody how to wash scopes in the middle of the day. Um, and then it's demoralizing for your team. And I, well, I, can't, I can't stress that. Well, I, I agree with you. And, and Chris, I will say that you know, we when our institution uh, was involved with the, the Monarch trial initially, one of the really uh, uh, the big barriers to moving forward with that platform is we're doing eight to ten advanced bronchoscopies a day with multiple bronchoscopists, and the ability to turn over the scopes, turn over the platforms, it just doesn't um, lend to efficiency in high volume uh, uh, institutions. Unless, in case, unless you want to be there like Kyle, eight o'clock at night doing these cases, because again, at the end of the day, we've got to get through the cases and we have to do it efficiently. So something that changes our workflow definitely changes how we approach the program itself. And something that's going to change our program uh, really isn't sustainable again for us. Um, next slide. So this is a very important slide, and I'm actually I'm going to touch it, but I'm going to let Krish go. You know, after this in a second, when we look at the amount of dose related uh, radiation with the C arm fluoro and EMB compared to the cone beam CTMB, to the patient you can't compare it. I mean, almost a seven times the difference in terms of the amount of radiation exposure. With, in all honesty, if you look at the images next side by side an incredibly similar image, and some might even argue a better image on the left from a clarity standpoint. You know, I, and, and Kyle and Chris and I have talked about this. Don't get me wrong, you can get an incredible view of a lesion with a cone beam CT, but the amount of radiation you have to utilize to get that image is typically not understood by any of us on a regular basis. People who use it on a regular basis will see the lower doses that are more uh, closer to equivalency or fluoro the images are nothing like what we see on posters, um, in journals, things of that nature. And in order to utilize that, you have to have a significantly high dose, not only for the first spin, but multiple spins that come after that. And as you look at it, in terms of the additional costs associated with it, the ability to perform fluoroscopy-based CR ENB with um, any of the, uh, the tomosynthesis uh, platforms is really no additional cost. Those, those fluoros, exist in your hospital. It's more of a question of obtaining one that is either in the OR with the neurosurgeons or now we honestly were able to justify it just based on the volume you're doing versus a cone beam CT, which is upwards of $1.5 million. If you're looking at the type of cone beam we need to be able to utilize to get the kind of diagnostic yields and the images we're looking for. And, and Chris and Kyle, I, I know you guys are passionate about this as well, so please jump in. No, I think it's funny, you know, um, whenever I do, uh, tilt or any kind of fluoro you know i'm not stepping out of the room but when you're doing the cone beam spin everybody goes leaping out of the room uh, <laughs> because it's an ungodly amount of radiation now people who are cone beam acolytes will tell you well we just lower the dose and then suddenly all that amazing crisp imaging that they like to talk about goes away you don't get to have it both ways you either have to zap the crap out of the patient and get some insanely crisp images with cone beam, or you got to dial it down and then you get crappy images. But the beautiful thing about Tomo, and then of course, having something like Tilt built in, is you get the quality images you need with obviously ridiculously lower radiation doses, and at the same time, zero additional costs. Yeah, and I, I, I want to say at least this this about the the NOAA team and, and, and how they listen. And I think uh, one of the things that I thought was really important was during the conversation of their build out with Tomo um, is all three of us said, let's improve this, let's improve this. Now they've gotten to a point with filters um, that it is actually quite impressive and um, and it can and rival that of cone beam CT without um, exposing the patient uh, to high doses of radiation. Um, and of course, most people have access to a standard uh, uh, C arm inside their OR, um, and it's not, and it's readily available. Um, I know that a lot of people would like to have fixed cone beam, but it's unrealistic. Let's just be clear. Um, and a lot of people would like to have COs or one of these mobile CT platforms, but they don't have either the political cloud or the cash uh, to obtain another half million dollar piece of equipment um, to make your total cost. 
uh, upwards up to a million dollars or more, depending on your contracts uh, with these companies. And so the main thing that I think that I walk away from this is say, wow, these images that you get from Tilt in combination, you also get augmented fluoroscopy. You also get strike point. You are, you are able to make these precision changes with the match study. We were 95% tool and lesion, 5% tool touch lesion, 100% diagnostic yield. And we weren't even trying to do this, but we had 60% center strike in the middle one third and three orthogonal planes with Combi. And this is with a digital tomosynthesis platform. I mean, I'll, I'll hand it to the, uh, you know, to Tao and, and the engineers at, uh, and, and the brains over at NOAA. Um, they really have something special here. No, I agree. Next slide. No, at the end of the day, you know, I, I will say that there's a number, obviously, of robotic platforms out there. But what separates the ability to diagnose the nodules we need is the integrated advanced imaging that we see with the Galaxy. I, you know, I, I talked to Krish and Kyle, uh, and they know that my hesitancy in general away from robotics is not only um, the, the challenges of localization, but the lack of imaging that's involved and integrated into it. This has really changed my perspective on how to utilize robotics with imaging to improve our diagnostic yields. And it makes the tool in lesion confirmation Again, it lets me sleep at night knowing that I can see the nodule and the, the needle overlapping, okay? Um, again, there's always on vision, uh, multiple ability to spin and confirm your, your needles in the nodule with NOAA and the Galaxy system, confirming on a re uh, objectively with strike point that your needle is in the middle of the nodule. Again, having the robotic solution that I really consider obviously the 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 stability is important, but the new maneuverability through the airways is what I consider you really to be able to visualize to get out to that nodule, not visualization of the nodule out in the periphery, which we know doesn't happen except for about 30 to 40% of the time. Disposable scopes have changed what we do in terms of the disposable cost and the ability to not worry about uh, cross-contamination. Um, the, honestly, the, the cognitive burden associated with these interfaces, the interface is probably the friendliest interface I've seen um, since I started bronchoscopy. Again, like Chris said, the company has really listened to people coming through um, uh, to see these platforms and made sure that it doesn't change our approach to cases, but it only fixes and improves our ability to get through these cases with workflow. The low cost solution, you know, that will be something to discuss in the future, but it is significantly uh, more cost sensitive and sustainable compared to what we're seeing with a number of other robotic platforms. And then the footprint, again, I don't want to be pushed out of my room because the robot is taking up half of my space. Um, I want to make sure that when I'm coming into my room, it's our room we control and we're able to move things the way we need to. And at the end of the day, this is the game changer that we've been looking for to not only to bring robotics to that, again, uh, that proposition we'd hoped for five years ago, but it's going to be able to bring us there and improve diagnostic yield so that we are getting patients through uh, to early diagnosis and diagnostic yield through advanced imaging and robotics. Um, so that being said, um, I do want to introduce um, uh, a very special guest of ours, uh, Dr. Taj uh, Segehi, who is uh, one of the um, bronchoscopist pulmonologists in Australia who's currently undergoing the trial and, and heading the trial uh, first in human for uh, NOAA and the Galaxy uh, with regards to diagnostic yields and procedures uh, today. So Taj, we really appreciate you uh, coming to and talking here. Do you mind giving us just an overview of how the, the, um, the study has been and what your first impressions are of utilizing the Galaxy robot? That being said, in a situation where you really haven't used robotics in the past, um, you've been mostly uh, bron you know, um, traditional bronchoscopy and rebus users with fluoro. How has this changed how you approached, you know, nodules in general and how you biopsy them overall? Hi guys, um, thanks for having me, um, and and thanks for uh, these great talks. By the way, um, setting up the scene. Um, I guess um, regarding the last point you made, Bobby. Um, 
Uh, you're right. Uh, no experience with robots at all. Um, in fact, we don't often actually use navigation systems outside uh, trial um, situations either. So our experience mainly, and and you know, um, high volume is very different in Australia to the US, obviously. So um, uh, our experience mainly with radial EBUS, ultra thin uh, fluoroscopy, occasionally CBCT uh, in an Azure suite. Um, we do have a a reasonably yield. We we actually often use bronchial branch tracing for navigation, which is which is quite fun um, and 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 rewarding. So this this really, I mean, when you think about it that way, there's been a learning curve, obviously, uh, for us, but not a not a very significant one, I must say. Um, and you know, everything you said, uh, you know, lives up in real life. Um, so we've been recruiting for a while now. We've done um, 15 cases. I've done 11 of them um, myself. Um, we have had, uh, I mean, the, the most amazing thing about this is to be able to see the lesion real time. And the fact that the system adjusts targeting based on on the tomosynthesis that it does during the procedure. And then, you know, you can actually see that, that the, the ball, the target, which was obviously uh, analyzed based on the pre-procedure CT scan, shifts and changes uh, in front of you based on real-time tomo, brings it, you know, really in front of you. And um, we have managed to, uh, out of our 15, to reach the lesion in all of them. Uh, we have had 100% uh, tooling lesion imaging, um, which has been amazing. It's been wonderful. Uh, and we have had 14 out of 15 diagnosis um, so far. Um, it's been, yeah, it's it's been a great experience, I must say. I think it's pretty and, neat so far that it matches up with the match study. I mean, small peripheral lesions for in pigs um, and small peripheral lesions in people. Um, you know, exactly, you know, what we expected. And I think, you know, as it's been so it's been so great to hear that from you, Taj, because uh, you know, it even though it was an animal lab, you know, it was very it was you know live breathing, bleeding animal. Uh, but you know, it's it's not people. Um, it's nice to know that the similar story, you know, that it's not just our slide saying, look how you can see, you can see the needle in the lesion. In a real heart beating, breathing patient, there's the needle going in the middle of the lesion. It's pretty cool. Yeah, and there's another this... factor there as well, which I think is um, is important to mention. Sorry, I mean, our system in Australia is, is very well used to using CT guided transthoracic biopsies and all the physicians kind of referrals tend to go that way because they preferred a high yield, uh, ign ignoring the risks, obviously. Um, and, and therefore, the referrals we get um, often have actually gone through that filter. So these are like weird and, oh, you know, wow. hard referrals that we get. I've, I've sent you a couple of pictures you have seen it as well. We've got this 14 millimeter nodule sandwich between the left ventricle and a pulmonary artery. Um, you know, no radiologist would have gone anywhere close to it. And we've got image on TOMO. We've got image uh, tool in lesion on that one. It's it's amazing. Tosh, let me ask you a quick question. Is do you um I, and we talk about Tomo in terms of a highlighting a lesion. When you heard about it, um, when it was described to you, you kind of were like, oh sure, that's gonna be great. But can you explain actually seeing it is a very different experience compared to what how it's described? And if people haven't seen Tomo, um, how do you describe the difference between how it sounds and describes to actually the image um, in terms of what you're trying to biopsy? All right. Uh, yeah, look, it's definitely a completely, uh, well, my background, a lot of fluoro, a lot of 2D fluoro. Um, the fact that you actually see the slices um, um, and, and, and you can actually see the 3D image of the lesion, it's a completely different experience. And, and the, the workflow also, uh, how different that is to a CBCT. I mean, we have finally managed to find the scope holder and, and we all run out the door and we have almost a 40 second breath hold uh, <laughs> for a CBC shot, which is you know, very um, um, convenient. But this is uh, this actually with our system has been a 12 second breath hold when everyone is in the room with, with low dose uh, radiation and 
and you know, a few seconds later, you've got a 3D image in front of you. Hey, also, Taj, remind me, I thought I also saw somewhere that your, your procedure time was like 40 minutes, you know, for, for someone who's not, and that's, you know, that's including all the tilts and, and everything else. Is that right? Is that roughly right? Yeah. Or maybe I misquoted I'm you. I'm having so much fun. I don't even pay attention to how much time has <laughs> gone. But I, I was going through the data the other day. Um, uh, we are writing the abstract. Hopefully we'll be presenting it in the U.S. later this year. Um, and um, I was I noticed that it's gone actually uh, way down, way down over the last uh, few cases, uh, and the last one was forty two minutes. Nice. Yeah, so a couple of things. First off, Taj, congratulations. I think um, you, you're a phenomenal guy. You're a great bronchoscopist, and it's uh, it's awesome to see you partake in the first. Uh, uh, digital tomosynthesis uh, integrated, fully integrated platform for robotics. Uh, so congratulations. The other aspect is, if you think about this and and you look at how cadaver studies with previous platforms were quoting these very very high diagnostic yields, and then they totally deteriorated when they went to humans. Right. Obviously, you're in the middle of your study. We're going to have to see how it rolls out. Um, but you said 14 out of 15, and I just pulled out my Samsung phone, guys. Um, and 92% uh, diagnostic yield. And that is impressive. Right out of the gate, um, and not a lot of navigation experience, uh, at least in comparison to the three of us. So that is really impressive. And yeah. and this is what I want to I want to drive home is that you know i've been at the podium for i think the last you know five years saying advanced imaging advanced imaging and advanced imaging um and finally we have a robotic platform that fully integrates it's out of the box you don't need to go buy something more expensive you can plug and play it. plug and play exactly you're very kind krish um i um if I had to reflect on the one case that we missed, which was in fact our first one, and that probably says a lot, um, I, I I kind of think that if uh, if you, Kyle or Bobby, or someone else who has had more experience with navigation and robot robotics was doing these cases, probably would have 15 out of 15. Because uh, to be honest with you, I've learned how to trust the technology. Uh, I've been doing this, you know. Um, uh, bronchial branch uh, tracing for a number of years now and um, I, I presented last year at AABIP as well we've got almost 80 percent yield with that which is our three-year data it's not you know and it's not a, a prospective study it's a retrospective audit so uh, 78.8 um, uh, so it, it was actually a bit hard for us to sort of ignore all of that and just trust the technology um, which is probably why we missed the first one, to be honest with you. <laughs> <laughs> well, but I will also say that even if you, and we've we've heard this more and more recently, even if the needle is in the lesion, it doesn't necessarily mean the lesion is in the needle, right? So you can get your needle into the lesion, know you're in there, and some sometimes tools are a limiting factor, right? Um, and sometimes, honestly, at the end of the day, you can only do so much. So as long as you know you're in the lesion and you feel comfortable that you've been in the lesion, that's as much as you can do on a regular basis with the type of imaging we're dealing with. The thing is, though, Bobby, we're all more aggressive about our biopsies when you are confident sure. that you're actually in the lesion. 100%. Right? Because you don't want to create the ultimate sin of no diagnosis and complication. Right. So, yeah. you know, if I know I'm in the lesion, I'm going to town on that thing. Right. Well, and I will also admit that with the use and advent of tomosynthesis in, in our bronchoscopy suite, because you know you're where you're supposed to be and you're in the lesion, our pneumothorax rate has plummeted, uh, mainly because we know where we are. Um, now, we can't argue, we can't say that with any other platform again, because there is no enhancement of the lesion, no augmentation of location. And that is, at the end of the day, if you look back on what we were doing 10 years ago without any advanced imaging, we had no idea where we are. Now we're bringing robotics into the place where it should be with that Im imaging, but it's obviously integrated into the actual robot at this point. Um, Let, yeah. let's, let's fire up some of the questions that have been coming yeah, yeah, in. Yeah, for sure. Well, the one was about this, how are we defining diagnostic yield? And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Taj, but it was obvious you know, malignancy 
or definitive benign diagnosis like you know you had granulomas that were positive for afb you know <laughs> for example you know right so it, inflammation is a non-diagnosis no, uh, no granulomas so with afb that's a diagnosis that is correct that is correct and we we do have for non-malignant diagnostic uh that what will for for non-malignant results we do have a six-month follow-up with a repeat right. ct scan and um uh, as well so that's that's the safety on that one um and um yeah so we've and also have we have had one ntm which was culture positive um and responded to treatment we had we had one inflammation that responded to treatment so ct scan after six weeks actually showed resolution of the lesion completely uh and uh yeah so cool. Now, the, another question came in, guys, about um, how, like, for example, one of the mobile cone beam systems doesn't actually offer augmented fluoro. So that, yeah. so like the SIOS integrates with the ion and it updates the lesion location in their their map. But when you step on the fluoro pedal, you don't get any augmented fluoro. And, you know, Taj, I mean, you know, when you talked about that lingular lesion that was near the ventricle, um, you know, you talked about how having seeing the needle go in the augmented lesion, and that augmented lesion you knew was real because you had just mapped it using tilt. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that confidence is everything in a location like that, isn't it? And I think the other key thing is you don't have to give up optics, right? I mean, so it's we have the ability to see, so we don't have to remove the optics when we use this device. We have the ability to do TOMO to update the lesion location, and then we have the ability to see under augmented fluoro, your needle actually go into it and then do another spin to confirm that you're dead center. I mean, it's 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 the ultimate integration of standard, you know, imaging to truly take the robot then where it needs to go. I mean, I, I you know, I think we all agree. I mean, if, if ever there was a definitive second generation robot, uh, this is it, um, you know, as far as the actual advancement from the base technology that we've all had for the last five years. And, and let me ask Chris, I, I want to direct one question that came up is um, the the disposable scopes and the idea of scope drift. Um, can you talk about that a little bit in terms of, you know, what you see with the current platforms and how um, the reduction in, in, in scope drift with these platforms? Yeah, and I think that and this is this is going over with both platforms talking to other users, but essentially what we can what we utilize um, is shape sensing. And so we use, look at a 2D screen and it looks like the lesion we're on target. Um, but when we know when we're looking on utilizing cone beam and using CT augmented fluoroscopy and we can check multiple planes, we notice that the catheter is drifting um, and we don't have a really good explanation. We don't understand why. Um, we've talked a lot about it with uh, with multiple other users. They've experienced a similar thing, and and catheter drift is a real thing. I think it's um, the 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 when you look at the shape sensing view, it does change, but on 2D it doesn't change. And so there's some mismatch there, um, and there's some with catheter stability. And so the nice thing about this is that with with tilt, hey, you don't have to worry about um, if there's going to be drift, you're using a brand new catheter every single time. The other piece is, is you're using imaging, and imaging uh, it trumps anything to do with virtual bronchoscopy. So it gives you that added level of safety. Um, I, I constantly have to um, readjust my catheter during bronchoscopy. Um, anybody who's visited has seen me go over and over again trying to uh, realign um, because of drift issues. So robotic stability, maybe not so much, at least with the shape sensing. Yeah. Do you notice, mm -hmm. Chris, is it, is it worse towards the like third, fourth, fifth time you've used the scope? Yeah, I don't know for sure. I've, we've talked about this a lot. Um, and, you know, I'm not a catheter expert in terms of engineering. But there is a concern that, that as you get to, you're utilizing the same catheter. They're brand new. And guess what? Uh, this is another thing. You know, that that we get these catheters. They're not even sterilized. And then we have to go sterilize them and then we have to use them so anyway um so you know all the cost is put on us so then yeah. we utilize this and then we <laughs> case after case after by the time we get to the fifth case um this is an issue and so i, I think that there's some concern and i'm not 100 percent sure what the reasons are if it's a hardware issue a software issue a catheter issue i have no idea but i know it's an issue and so um luckily 
Um, I have uh, comb beam in my room and I can correct for CT to body divergence in some of the catheter drift issues. When I'm not in my comb beam room, you know what I'm using? Super D because I can see where I'm going. And so that tells you already like that this digital tomosynthesis is meaningful to me. And so, um, and, and advanced imaging uh, trumps any type of virtual bronchoscopy. It, it's actually interesting, Chris. It sounds like the catheter drift, that, since you said the platform doesn't update the fact that the catheter has moved, that your CT to body divergence actually worsens during the case. Yeah. And so when you literally look at, beyond all the other things we've talked about. Yeah. The target view, which is a 2D uh, representation, doesn't take into account the changes in 3D. Um, and so what you can overcome that by you can see it on the shape sensing, which is this weird virtual snake-like structure where you can see the catheter articulation. And those of you who are ion users will understand what I'm talking about. But if you look at your fluoro and you start checking in multiple planes, you start to realize um, that there's drift. Well, so in, in that same vein, Taj, have you guys used the strike point um, in terms of during the study? Um, yes, yes, of course. I mean, that's, Have you that's thought it's, um, how has it been? Yeah, having an objective measure. Oh yeah, absolutely. Because that 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 um, slice number that that basically tells you how far you are from the target that you've chosen. Um, you know, if you've got a, a fourteen millimeter nodule and and you've chosen the center of it as your target, and um, the slice number of your needle, the tip of your needle, and and the center of the um, lesion is only like two millimeters. You know, you know you're there, um, and that's 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 the beauty of it. I mean, it gives you a lot of confidence with um, with your results. Yeah, and this and, just to clarify, it's not the distance of your of your catheter from the nodule. It is actually the distance from the center of your needle. Exactly. Right. That's the tool. Yeah. yeah. Amazing. Um, there was one other question. Um, which again is a little challenging at this time to talk about, but was um, how uh, how the single-use bronchoscope cost compared to other disposable catheters on the market? I mean, I think the challenge is again the disposable catheters. I mean, uh, bronchoscopes on the market are sold as a single bronchoscope as a disposable for the procedure. Again, these are kits. This is just like a navigation kit, the scope. Um, so again, I, I think that's going to be more dependent on institutions um, as opposed to a general cost. So I think that is something to discuss down the road. Uh, but again, I will tell you, and 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 Noah uh, has been pretty um, diligent about this idea of bringing this capability, this robot, to everyone, and not making sure that they're you know they're breaking the bank in order to do so. So if anything, it's going to be comparable to the current catheters or cheaper. But hey, at least you won't have to go buy a Cobeam, Sios, or Mobile CT. You can just use the C arm you already own. Yeah. And even Bobby, you so eloquently said that it didn't matter if you were in New York City or Idaho. Um, the, all, all three, all four of us, we just, we know, we want you to have the, the, the ability to be able to use advanced imaging and combined with robotics and just get a diagnosis. It's good for the patient, it's good for the field, and it's good for the bronchoscopist. Um, and patients can get answers. Um, and I know Taj, uh, I had seen a, uh, a story about a, a patient that had, you know, a very young patient, at least appeared to look young, um, and had a small lung nodule and went for resection and otherwise wouldn't have had that. Yeah, 37 year old female. Yeah. Oh, God. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah that's, on the that's so you change life, and that's fantastic. And that, that's yeah, the joy. Yeah. That's digital tomo. Cool. I, I mean, think um, um, that wraps it up, doesn't it? Yeah. Allison, I, I don't know if you want to talk uh, briefly about you know the experience of Galaxy that's going to be coming down the line, because frankly, the goal is, again, to get everyone to understand and exposed to this technology so that they can, again, get it whether in New York or in Idaho, man. Absolutely, thank you. And I, I think this will bring us to close. So for everyone on the call, thank you for attending. I'm Allison Kramer with NOAA Medical. Um, just wanted to briefly introduce some of the upcoming events that we'll be having. We have our Top Gun experience, which invites you out to our facility here in Sunnyvale, where you go through, as you can see here on the screen, a rotation of different breakouts, one of them, including a cadaver lab, where you get hands-on with the system and get to drive to multiple pseudo lesions. We will also be at ATS, um, AABIP, and then CHESS later this year. So come see us there. And we wear leather jackets for Top Gun. 
<laughs> you can and aviators. And I've got them for you. <laughs> Todd, you 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 wear a uh, uh, leather jacket. I asked if you bronc with your leather jacket on. <laughs> <laughs> He's laughing because it's true. <laughs> he only he only dances with it. <laughs> well, thanks, guys. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thanks, everyone. Taj, great to see you, buddy. Thanks for having me. Looking forward to catching up. Absolutely. Thanks.